I will um, introduce them. First, I want to share with you some of the objectives of this session. We scheduled this session in the symposium so that you would gain some information that would enable an understanding of how NPs have made notable contributions to care across sectors during COVID-19. Also, we hope this information demonstrates how this contribution can advance NP scope of practice in the future. And then lastly, we hope the information identifies alignment with the key recommendations of the Nursing Task Force Vision for Tomorrow that you heard about this morning. Now, in terms of our speakers today, we're delighted to have with us Sherry Morrell. And Sherry is a nurse practitioner. She's engaged in nursing education and clinical practice. She's currently studying for her PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Not unlike what we were talking about this morning, she is doing everything. She brings a strong background in physical therapy and rehabilitation to her work as an NP. Sherry has worked at the University of Windsor in the Faculty of Nursing since 2006. She's teaching both in the undergraduate nursing program and the nurse practitioner program. Additionally, she has been the placement coordinator for the NP program for the last four years. Concurrently, Sherry works as a nurse practitioner in the community. Most recently, Sherry has contributed her NP knowledge and skills at Grand Morris Urgent Care, and prior to that at the Windsor Regional Hospital Emergency Department. Now, Sherry is a member of the Nurse Practitioner Task Force and has been invaluable in the recommendations related to the curriculum and nurse practitioner practice and education. Yeah. And with her on the panel today is Dania Versailles. And Dania is an accomplished bilingual award winner, registered nurse leader, who has over 25 years of experience. Yeah, all the time there's opportunity. Uh, could I just ask that you mm -hmm. uh, put your mics on mute, please, so that we don't have background information or noise. <laughs> uh, so, Dania has over 25 years of experience in specialty clinical areas and home care at the bedside and in management, in education and with research teams. So covering all the domains of nursing. This includes 10 years of experience working closely with NPs across settings. She has an unshaken commitment to promote a better understanding of mental health and addiction to facilitate the recovery and healing of clients and families to improve their lives. Now, she is the Director of Clinical Services at the Canadian Mental Health Association in Ottawa. There, she works with outreach teams who support vulnerable persons with severe mental illness and often addiction. They're referred from a variety of sectors, governments, and correction services. Dania also oversees education of healthcare workers within the Canadian Mental Health Association for community partners, staff, and the public at large to raise awareness, reduce stigma, and assist workers in addressing social determinants of health. So Dania works with a diversity of frontline uh, caregivers, executives, policymakers, influencers, and even with a local TV station. Dania has invaluable observations on how the roles of nurse practitioners have and can continue to expand to positively impact the system during and beyond the pandemic. So I will now ask our uh, presenters uh, to begin. Thank you, Army Jane. That's a great presentation to the both of us, Sherry and I. Um, 
I think I speak for both of us when I say we're, we're really uh, fortunate and grateful for being part of this lineup of amazing, amazing speakers and, and uh, influencers in nursing and NP. And congratulations on the launch of uh, what the task force has been working on for the past several months. Um, like uh, Tara and, and Hudu, like they described their, their work before and uh, a few other speakers, you know, um, during pandemic, the pandemic, mental health has been, uh, everyone's mental health has been affected. And for us, particularly with our clients, we have to understand that our clients um, have entered the system broken um, in crisis, often with little to no follow-ups. Uh, they've, um, they have a very low trust level level of trust in uh, healthcare providers because the, the system is so fragmented and they, always, and they often navigate through the cracks of the system. And during the pandemic, these cracks have um, amplified. And so they're, they're, they, they, all, all, they always navigate with um, some level of um, trauma um, as previous speakers have um, spoken about. Um, they face considerable social determinants of health challenges, um, especially when they don't have any ID cards, healthcare cards, no physicians um, uh, or NPs. Uh, and there it's just it's, and that's the baseline. And so, of course, during COVID, uh, the demand for nursing services has um, um, amplified. And so, as others have mentioned, uh, we see more consultation, more referrals, more need for harm reduction uh, interventions, for nicotine replacement, for opioid, who did not go on pause during COVID. In fact, we have more cases and death related to opioid, the, the mm -hmm. opioid crisis. Um, and yeah, and then, and as um, Huda mentioned before, a lot of our clients um, live with considerable amount of um, number of comorbidities and co-substance use, uh, co-concurrent co substance use. And so the need for nurse practitioners is profound uh, for more of them in the system and particularly in the community. At the turn of um, COVID, you know, back in March when we were in quarantine, many, many, many um, physicians um, closed their doors and flipped their services into the virtual uh, world platforms. Well, hmm, who will this affect again? <laughs> you know, so this, this raises the issue of health equity or inequitable access to primary care. And so early on, the, our nursing manager, who is an NP, as well as um, our nurse practitioner and other nurse practitioner and, and nurses, have quickly um, rallied and um, identified the access to virtual equipment and virtual platforms with data as an essential need um, to continue um, providing our, our, the services. You know, us two were um, designated as essential workers. And so, um, so yeah, so we we quickly leveraged the partnerships that we already had in order to uh, administer injections to our clients, so to prevent deterioration, deterioration and um, uh, and to preserve their uh, stability, mental stabilities. And also, um, we have to keep in mind this was in an environment where um, the support and services of our the rest of our employees, which are mainly uh, social workers um, and other professionals with criminal criminology um, backgrounds um, were already operating in a restricted environment. And so on the flip side, on the second uh, column, you can see there, there was room for a role expansion, which it was not a question. Um, they, they took the stage, center stage, and they were essential members of our pandemic response and management team. Um, we developed new protocols, enhanced those that we, we had, procedures, um, the education training for our non-nursing non staff were um, 
uh, consistent and um, individualized and done in little batches um, in our new uh, building um, and to respect you know, physical distancing and all. And as well, when we were um, offered um, access to emergency funds, a large portion of the, our funds were geared towards um, the acquisition of um, uh, mobile devices, um, smart smartphones and, and tablets so that we can continue um, providing our services one-to-one, -one, face to face, but virtually in the hands of our clients. Um, this required a level of training that they never had or peer support workers step up to the plate and became um, other heroes, unknown heroes, because in, never in a million years, they thought they were going to be able to um, learn um, how to manipulate uh, smart devices. And, and because of them, we were able to continue to offer our group um, or support groups um, to our clients. And the attendance rate of these groups skyrocketed and, and maintained. So this was great because um, as we all know, um, social isolation was a big factor. And so, yeah, and so this is how nur our nurse practitioners were able to step up, step in and take charge and, and help us navigate through um, the various adjustments that we've known, you know, we've had to do in the past, what, eight months now, eight, nine months. And um, this is how this is how we responded to COVID at the Canadian Mental Health Association. How about you, Sherry, from the academic setting? So I'm um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a different role, and I'd like to thank RNO for inviting me, and I'd like to thank the attendees for our table talk discussion. Um, so you've heard a lot about roles of NPs. I wanna talk a little bit about the role of an NP who works in the academic setting. I also work in clinical as you heard, but it was a little bit different. And that little harried picture there on the side, that was me. So when COVID struck, I'm the clinical placement coordinator and anyone who knows anything about academic clinical placements or works as a preceptor knows how hard it is to organize and match them up and get it all done. So we're going great. COVID strikes, no problem. I don't hear any concerns. We're doing good. Okay, everyone's going to finish the term because it's winter term now. We only got about one month to go. All of a sudden, we're in Windsor down here. So your practice may vary a little bit than from what we had, but our border closed and our border restricted access from anyone from the US coming over here. That impacted nurses. Our hospitals started to say no nurses that work in the states can work in Canadian hospitals and further to that if you're a nurse that works in multiple settings you have to choose one. So what then happened was all the community agencies and the nursing homes pretty much followed suit and they stopped all clinical placements for a very short time for all our students. So what happened was we had to pull all the students and then think of the result was the students are going to be able to finish their last couple of weeks of clinical, what are we going to do? And honestly, we had no plan B. So there was no backup. So we didn't really kind of have anything to do um, as far as how are they going to finish their hours? What was the plan? Um, retrospectively, we should have seen it coming and maybe had a plan a little bit earlier. But how it worked out for winter term was there weren't too many um, students. So we were able to pass them through on the hours they already had but it would impact our IP or our last school session in the summer, but we started thinking ahead. Now we said, what is our plan B? And we started looking at virtual clinical. And we had to see for the CNO's perspective, what is the regulations for an NP license? Is it um, specific clinical hours as it is in the States or is it more on competencies. So we found out it's more competencies and not necessarily ours. So as long as you can provide, show that your students meet all the competencies, they don't have to have per se a number of set hours. So we ended up doing, finding out how many clinical placements, some were starting to open up and let us come back. And so we got half virtual and half clinical. So all our students in Windsor rotated through their IP program from May until August, 
um, they did six weeks in virtual classroom and then six weeks uh, virtual clinical and then six weeks face to face with the preceptor. Um, so to do this, we had to hire on a person to become our virtual preceptor is what we termed it. But they started going back, clinical settings were allowed to take them in. Now it started a whole new problem. The sites in the hospitals would provide all PPE. However, no community settings would provide PPE for our students. They wanted us to provide PPE, but we couldn't get any PPE because we weren't a healthcare setting and we were restricted from getting PPE from anywhere. So it was a bit of a struggle for us to actually get our students there. The Ministry of Health stepped in with us and they got us PPE. They arranged PPE. They said we could have it for free. Um, unfortunately, our placement started in May. I didn't get my first place shipment until July. So we were begging from community centers that let us use your PPE, we'll replace it when we get there. The first shipment was supposed to have 28 boxes. I got one box of N95 masks. So I had nothing. Uh, by then though, our site that we usually get our students stuff from, they said, we will get you something. So they ended up coming in and then our ministry stuff showed up so we could reimburse all the community for all the PPE that we were, um, that we were missing. So that was the added struggle. And then you had to show up at the clinical with your bag, knock on their door and say, here's all my PPE for the student who's in your placement. So you had to drive over the Windsor Essex County area to disperse the PPE. So interestingly, it came up with everything's good. Our students are now mostly clinical, but we are still doing virtual this term. We have half and half going on right now because we have the additional problem is a lot of our students, a lot of them work in the US as an RN right now. So mm -hmm. they still will not let them go to clinical if they're practicing as an RN in the States. So we, we continue to have our virtual component for our student. But what, wonders, what we wonder is, how is this preparing our students? Is virtual clinical preparing them enough for um, as it would as face-to-face? -face? And is the lack of community placements, is that gonna affect their preparedness for our MP students to actually work in a community setting? Dana, what do you think of that? So can you repeat the question, how, how well, we have, we have virtual now and we have face-to-face -face, and we have a lot of limited placements in clinical settings right now in the community because hospitals are willing to take them, but some sites are still virtual. And this group of students who are graduating this year mm -hmm. have not as much community placement. So I'm concerned about two things. Is the placement that we're giving them virtual, is it comparable to the face-to-face? And this is a perfect area where we need to research on. What is the differences between the graduating student that did virtual, that does face to face, that does both? But more importantly, are the NP students now going to be prepared to function in a primary care in the community? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, it talks about how our capacity to. Um, further attract NPs to the community, um, retain them in the community. Um, so of course, along with that goes, we need more funding. Um, we need to reduce the gap in funding and compensation. Uh, you know, Doris was talking about harmonization this morning uh, to reduce the gap between, you know, hospital setting, community self setting, home care setting. These all play um, uh, a role. There are um, important factors to consider in order to open the door nice and wide for more um, opportunities for NP graduates uh, or NP students to do graduate. Um, and with COVID and the physical distancing um, and virtual care, um, if, uh, Irma Jane, if you can go on to the next slide. Um, we, it's a, it's, it's a big question to answer. So we, 90% of our work in the community is face-to-face -face, um, from the get-go. Uh, most of our clients are transient, um, homeless, or vulnerably housed, um, and they come from, you know, emergency departments or, or, or the units, 
uh, mental health units uh, from the courts and justice system with, with partners, hospital partners, and also community partners. Um, our saving grace was really the capacity to give to clients in their hands the tools needed to have one-on-one -on -one care um, and, and support uh, as well as a uh, group. Um, now, I cannot speak from a nurse, a nurse practitioner's perspective because, uh, because I don't practice it. And I, I, I'm not an NP. However, what I can tell you is that without the virtual devices, we wouldn't be able to prevent um, deterioration of our clients um, to, to manage suicidality um, in, in the community. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to access um, you know, the medication or, or to provide direct care. I'm um, talking about nurses and, and, and NPs at our organization. So it's, it's from my perspective and I'm not a, an academic person. So I, it, it, I would tend to say that a hybrid solution um, is best. Um, and I know that in our business, we would have loved to receive more NPs. Uh, the shelters are in great, great, great need of, um, of um, nurse practitioners. Uh, and I say that because, because I favor nurse practitioners <laughs> over doctors, I'm a little biased, but um, we already are working with um, an organization in the community that offer um, NP services. Uh, we need to duplicate them. Um, and um, yes, and so here in the picture that you see uh, on the slide, um, first the, the larger one uh, where it says 10 city resident points to villainization, blah, 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 from the Ottawa citizen. Thank you, Irma Jean. Um, this is one of our worker who was helping um, one of our nurse practitioners, which is shown in the smaller picture with his backpack um, to help um, clients who did not want to go back to the shelters because um, it's triggering, it's filled with trauma, it's, it's really not the best environment to work on your recovery. Um, and he, in the smaller picture here, you see um, our nurse uh, practitioner, Christy, with the police where we already have, because of our court team, we already have a, uh, a partnership with the Ottawa Police Services um, for a number of different um, justice-based um, you know, support services. But here in particular, during the summertime, encampments became a real big problem to the city of Ottawa, and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, and they're walking here in the water, they're, they're walking here in the water towards a little island um, that's off of the main Ottawa land um, to help clients who were poorly um, followed up um, and who were in great need of primary care. Um, and in, in an effort to avoid what could have been a really messy, negative front page situation, had it not been um, uh, the fact that we have a really good positive relationship with our Ottawa Police Services. And so this is an example of how um, nurse practitioners can advocate um, in order to, to lessen the um, legal-based or justice-based impact, negative impact that our clients are subject to often. Um, and the last point on my slide on the, on the, the right of your screen mentions housing first. This is really, um, I could spend an hour just talking about this, mm -hmm. but this is really a program that is aimed at um, providing the individualized strength-based recovery-based support to clients who are looking for a permanent home in the community that they know best because it can connect with the community resources over there. And so that that, that is the link with the uh, 10 city uh, picture that you see here. So um, yeah, for, for us, the NPs are the untapped resource of the healthcare system. And I sit right now in, um, one of the Ontario health team in Ottawa. And it's, I'm flabbergasted at the lack of NP representation there. Um, it's just, it's just astounding. So Sherry, back to you. How does that all relate to their recommendations? 
Uh, so I, yep, I'm listening and I'm manning the chat at the same time and I'm responding to people. They are, we're just discussing virtual versus uh, hands-on and there's some really great um, chat discussion going on about uh, the differences. And we have recognized that uh, virtual and face-to-face -face is totally, um, it's a new thing, but I agree. We need to keep some virtual in there because down the road, we're gonna have, um, we can augment those case studies that students don't get, but you're missing the population interaction and learning about the different clients. So it can't be all virtual, but I'd like a little virtual with face-to-face. -face. So that's down the road what you were planning. And all of these things we think align with many of the task force recommendations. However, we just picked out a couple. Um, so obviously we need to align the nurse practitioner curriculum with the expanding scope of practice. Um, it makes it a little bit difficulty because a scope comes out and it's like, okay, we can do this tomorrow. Or, oh, starting now you can do this. Well, curriculum needs to try to catch up. We can't quite, quite catch up that quickly. So it would almost be nice if we had, you know, a little bit of warning. And even when we know it's so hard to incorporate it, but we need to in, um, academic settings, we need to be able to align our curriculum for when the students know what's going out. Unfortunately, with the short time frame of the MP curriculum, it makes it a little bit difficult to try to get in what's important to keep in and is there anything we can now take out. And numerous um, other people have discussed the need for um, research and research in NP. And I love the idea of a task force lead for research um, because we really, we do have segments of NPs doing research, but we really need to uh, do that and show it to practice. We did some COVID research at the University of Windsor um, related to undergrads and now they're looking at NPs as well. But we need a link where we can say what's going on in NP research and these task force recommendations are um, so important. And I guess the other one um, is, is about education and community as well. Engaging everyone campaigns to get out the knowledge about what do NPs do? What can NPs do? How can we fully utilize NPs in organizations and in institutions and get the public out there and engage them to know what an MP is? I know now we have more NPs, but when I first started, and I still get it to some degree, I got it at work the other day. So they'll always say, you're a what? You're an NP, is that a nurse? <laughs> yes. And then they still ask me, oh, so you're almost a doctor, you're training to be a doctor. One asked me the other day, are you going through to be a doctor now? No, I'm a nurse practitioner. And I find there's not enough in the public knowledge about our NP role who we are, how we are the same as nurses and different, and how we are do similar things to physicians, but we're different. Um, so uh, those were kind of ones I just kind of thought might fit in, but so many of the task force recommendations are essential to community and academic. Well, listen, I want to thank uh, both of you, Dania and Sherry, and uh, let uh, those of you who are here know that now we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we actually fortunately have uh, about 12 minutes for questions. So I'm quite thrilled. And I have noticed the, the questions that uh, have been addressing the academic program. And uh, we also have some talking about how we really need to extend mental health uh, services by NPs um, into other settings. And um, I'm wondering maybe if uh, one point we might want to start with, and I know, um, uh, Sherry, you've already spoken about academia, but uh, both of you, uh, are there comments you might have about the length of the uh, program? <laughs> Don't MP? even get me started. <laughs> okay. okay, when I started, <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you, when I started, we could only, we had a little list of medication we could prescribe, and I could prescribe Fusidin cream, but I couldn't prescribe Fusidin ointment. So I asked, I prescribed Fusidin ointment, I got a call from the pharmacist, you can't order that. 
I said, but I don't want the cream. I want the ointment. Well, you can't order that. So from the time I was there, all of a sudden, the whole thing opened up. You can order any med. Oh, now you can order narcotics. And now we're going to add on all these um, diagnostic tests and CTs and MRRs are coming. But have you changed the length of the program? No, you have not. Um, and now we're the stuff. It was the same length of program that I took that my students are taking now. But there was so much less of my scope than it's now. And how can you fit it all in? How can we fit everything in that's expected for us to teach those students? I, I now go to them, okay, guys, we have a three hour lecture where I'm your tutor, I'm not your lecturer. So we're gonna discuss everything there is about cardiac and we're gonna talk about EKGs and we're gonna talk about rhythm strips. Um, so it's almost impossible to get that whole curriculum through. Okay. Um, and I, and that's that's not any comments? Yeah. Um, that's very unfortunate. Um, and um, along with that, uh, I would love to see the um, period of um, the clinical placement period uh, extended and, and, and more diversity also, um, I guess. Um, now, keep in mind, I don't have the curriculum fresh in my mind like Sherry does, but um, I know that when I saw uh, a few NPs come, come through the CMHA, I, it seemed to me and it's insufficient, insufficient. Yeah, it has to keep up with the to keep up with the times, as Sherry mentioned. Um, and yeah, period. We just need to we need to we, we need to stretch it out. We need to expand the scope and the the opportunities to to engage them with various population um, where NPs are needed and required. And it's not just about the hospitals. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because I'm thinking of the other presenter next door to us. Yes. Well, and, and that is something that uh, I think we've really clearly demonstrated here. There's such a broad role uh, for NPs across all sectors. And one of the things that really struck me in working on the task force and seeing the many cases that our task force uh, uh, members contributed is the key role NPs play with marginalized and vulnerable and underserviced populations. Uh, talk about the social determinants of health and sustainable development goals. NPs are there and they are doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and this is um, very much, um, I'm pretty sure the other CMHAs are, are, are structured the same way, um, maybe, to, and so there are some differences um, to some extent, but um, in Ottawa, we're offering a menu of, of services to align with and to help clients um, be referred to the right type of support. So we're talking about employment support, court and justice support, um, outreach um, and long-term intensive case management um, support. We offer subsidized um, uh, housing and and rental um, supplementation. We know that we know that um, as soon as a person has a place, a space to call their own, things can happen more tangibly, tangibly and and rapidly, and for the long term in terms of their recovery, getting back on their feet, um, getting connected to their uh, communities based on their strengths and where they, they are at and their the stages of changes and, and where they're at in terms of their motivation. So um, nurses, for, I, I, dare I say, even from the RPN level, have are exposed to social determinants of health. And the more uh, you advance in your studies, um, the more you can realize, you realize how um, important um, how, how significant it is uh, to assist clients. I'm not so sure that the medical model um, is performing well in that, in that aspect. That's my personal opinion. Um, but again, more research is, is needed to show how NPs can demonstrate, can make a um, significant difference uh, for a client's, uh, client outcomes. And I think you're absolutely right. It's well documented the medical documented the medical model 
does not necessarily work well in the community, nor in sectors like long-term care. I see Wendy's on, I'm sure she can comment. Um, the medical model, I think, works in uh, highly specialized services in acute care hospitals. Um, now we have, uh, I think someone might have been trying to speak. Did I speak over you? Um, I was just going to say I was going to try to answer some of the chat questions that are yes, coming. Yes, go ahead, um, share. So I know Maureen was mentioning that, um, you know, the two-year program, it, it, it could be just that we need to get better quality and not so much and get rid of the stuff we don't need. And somebody else agreed about practicum. Interestingly, someone asked about um, changing the scope, getting the MP primary care and pediatric to a more generalized. I know that that is the potential of having a general entry level NP role is the talk from the CNO and to have later uh, certification on possibly um, expanded roles of the NP. When that's coming, I have no idea. I don't know if uh, Irma Jean, if you know any more about that than I do. No, I don't. And it, it appears to have been maybe delayed. Uh, I thought it was uh, being talked about quite mm -hmm. uh, substantially before, but I have not necessarily heard much now. And I, I don't know if Michelle may know more about it in terms of um, some of the work she's doing, Michelle Acorn, but certainly um, I'm not aware. Right, I, yeah. Um, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? I think there is a question here that I wanted to um, point out and, uh, or I wondered, Eric, if you wanted to make any comments because Eric Staples, I think is on and yep. he's doing quite a bit on curriculum. Perfect. There is, um, in fact, it, it's not just the CNO about this generalist NP, it's, it's across our country that uh, there was a study done by all of the 12 regulators formed a group called the Council of College of Registered Nurses, CCRNR. Yeah, CCRNR. Yeah. And they did a study back in 2015 of all NPs and found all NPs were using the same competencies. So then they were wondering, why, why are we writing all different exams? Should there not be one NP generalist education program with one regulatory process uh, to get them into practice. But, uh, and Irma Jean and I were both on a teleconference about this. What it, what it did though was create questions about what happens to the NP pediatrics program? What happens to the neonatal program? Mm -hmm. What happens to the NP adult program? Or do these all get filtered into hopefully paid residencies after you do your generalist program, much like a medical resident is paid a stipend to do their residency in the field of their choice. Um, I think um, having worked, I'm, I'm doing a postdoc with uh, Kazan <coughs> and having worked with uh, their accreditation group, there, there's a lot of movement and talk amongst NP educators about the core graduate courses and how they've become a little bit bland. And are, do they fit any more or as much with what is going to be expected of the NP role vis-a-vis -vis COVID now? Virtual care, we need, you know, the US have courses in virtual care now because of COVID. So you would take a course in virtual care. Do you really need nursing science or nursing theory course again? Do you need qualitative and quantitative research? You took that in your BSCN. Hopefully in the NP courses, you're getting some of that knowledge translation through looking up research about best evidences for uh, what tests you're going to do, what assessments are best, those kinds of things. And in streamlining, because you can't really add too much more to these programs, the longer the programs are, the universities lose money. Mm -hmm. And the universities are already under fiscal restraint as it is. So it's a catch-22 about, about this. But um, stay tuned about the CCRNR. Yeah, and no more funding. We already, because we already went there and said, you know, how can we teach 
everything you're expecting us to add on in the time frame. And they said there will be no other funding for extending these programs to a uh, more length of time. So you have to figure out what to fit in um, in your time frame. So then there needs to be a better uh, or maybe enhanced partnership between academic settings and, and clinical settings um, of various kinds to, to ensure that we offer as much as many opportunities as possible to, uh, you know, cement the knowledge that they gain in, in, uh, in, in the classrooms and uh, so that they can better be prepared for the world. As and we that even today. brings up the um, our NP scope if you want to work in academic which I, I believe that I should still be working in clinical. I'm not saying I don't, but you have to work your full-time job as faculty in academic. Um, and then I need to now have a second job so that I can continue teaching in my NP role. And mm -hmm. if I wanna teach an undergrad, the DNP is not acceptable and I have to have a PhD or I'm limited to only the NP. So, mm -hmm. you know, for NPs to jump to different sectors and do different things, um, it makes it a little bit difficult to do sometimes. So I think that varies as well across our country. Some NPs with a DNP go into a teaching track. Uh, a lot of yes. universities either have a teaching track or a tenure track. Uh, that's all to do with funding as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, tenure track gets more funding than teaching track. Um, all of these are, they, they're always money questions when it comes down. Yeah. Well, lots to really uh, talk about and think about with NP education. And uh, we have uh, numerous uh, parts in the recommendation. And I think you'll hear uh, more about NP education and it connects so well with the comments you're talking about, Dania, really addressing those social determinants of health. I think yes. uh, the whole issue of uh, virtual versus okay. non-virtual, um, one of the biggest uh, pieces of feedback I've heard about NPs in the workplace is that they are there in person. And you made it very clear, Dania, that uh, if you only require or enable virtual care, you further disadvantage the disadvantage. So I Absolutely. really think we must uh, move on. Our next session will be starting. Um, I'm going to see if the um, poll will work here. And I'm hoping that we have the link to the next session put in the chat box. Uh, and I'll so put my email in the chat box support. if anyone wants to talk to me um, about academic or anything you want. I'll put my email in the chat box and feel free to send me an email. Thank I'll do you the same thing as well. Much. Thank you both. And thank you, Dania and Sherry. That was a very invigorating session. And feel free to use the poll and give us your feedback. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thanks Eric, for helping us jumping in there. Yes, thank you. And then uh, we are now going into the session uh, from uh, 2.15 to 2.30, which is hearing all about the nurse practitioner interest group. And from there, we will have a break. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I just need to see that you can see the chat to the main room, uh, the link to the main room there. Can you all? Yes, we can. Good, okay. So if you click on that and then uh, remember the meeting ID and uh, the passcode 448331.